fresh meat. It may seem hard to believe, but Clive Barker, one of the biggest names in the horror genre, has only directed three films. The first, and most notorious, is Hellraiser, released in 1987 when the prolific author and artist was just 35 years old. After the success of that movie, he went on to direct Nightbreed, released in 1990 in a severely compromised version of his original vision. That experience may have given others pause, but Barker wanted to delve back into the film world with a very different kind of project. Something that combined horror and film noir, something that audiences hadn't seen before. The elevator pitch could easily be The Exorcist meets Chinatown, and it would follow a hard-boiled private detective into the rarely seen underworld of magic and illusion. After a few years of development, Barker would get the chance to make that movie. And though it would also be altered by the studio against his wishes, it would go on to become a cult classic in the truest sense of the term. A movie mostly ignored upon initial release, but ultimately found itself clutch close to horror fans' dark hearts. The film in question is Lord of Illusions, and we're going to find out what the f*** happened to this horror movie. I knew you'd come. I've got so much power to give you, Swan. Lord of Illusions was inspired by a Barker short story called The Last Illusion, which would feature the first appearance of a recurring character in the Barker world named Harry Damore. Harry is a classic literary figure, the world-weary private eye who's seen it all. But in this case, the things he sees are of the supernatural variety. Harry has an unfortunate bond with the paranormal, something he can't help or easily navigate. Barker wanted to bring this character to the big screen and put a creepy new spin on a well-worn genre, the detective story. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. The film sees New Yorker Harry Damore still reeling from a supernatural encounter, investigating the strange world of illusion in Los Angeles, and stumbling into a bizarre case that he soon can't get out of. Harry finds himself invited to see the performance of a famous magician named Swan, and in the process gets cozy with Swan's woman, Dorothy. When it looks like Swan has died in the middle of one of his magic acts, Harry discovers something much bleaker is going on. Something to do with the impending resurrection of a real-life sorcerer named Nyx, who used actual magic to entrance a number of cult members, including his protege, Swan. Intriguingly, if the film had been a success, Barker pictured Harry as a character that could get into several different adventures, in the tradition of Indiana Jones. In an interview, Barker said, I thought if I'm going to make another series of horror movies, why not base it around the hero? Harry can be involved in a series of very different confrontations from movie to movie. You're almost taking a little leaf from Die Hard or Indiana Jones and transferring that to the horror genre. Barker had been writing The Last Illusion screenplay as early as 1991, but he didn't think it was going to be his next movie after Nightbreed. Instead, he was preparing a project called Eden USA, which unfortunately never materialized. When he was able to get funding for The Last Illusion, it was through Polygram Filmed Entertainment, and the budget was tight, somewhere in the 10 to $11 million range. But Barker was optimistic despite the smallish budget, saying in an early interview, My belief is that the movie on the page delivers. My duty now is to put that on screen as clearly as possible, with as few compromises as possible. We have a tight budget, and obviously we may have some compromises. He was indeed prophetic about that. For the role of Harry Damore, Barker cast Scott Bakula, fresh off of Quantum Leap and looking for something a little darker to play with. It would turn out that Bakula embodied everything Barker had imagined when he wrote the character. Barker later said, He's the Harry I've had in my head for eight years. No word of a lie. When he stepped on set, in costume for the first time, I thought, this is wonderful, this is the man I've been writing about for eight years. And that's a real thrill to see an actor so beautifully embody somebody than you've been writing about for such a long time. It's a real thrill. For his part, Bakula was thrilled with Barker's acceptance of him, saying it helped tremendously to have the writer saying, you're the guy, you're perfect for Harry. 
True to his word, Barker would later admit that he pictured Bakula in his head whenever he wrote Harry going forward. For the role of Dorothy, Barker chose former model Famke Johnson, who up until that point had only been featured in bit parts. Barker allegedly found Famke's picture in a pile with dozens of others, and he was apparently immediately smitten with the leggy brunette's femme fatale looks. Barker's bet paid off, obviously, as Famke was soon cast in the 007 sequel, Golden Eye which would be released only three months after Lord of Illusions. For the villainous Nyx, Barker cast Daniel Von Bargen, who would go on to be best recognized as George Costanza's idiot boss, Mr. Kruger, in the final seasons of Seinfeld. Barker allegedly had to convince Von Bargen to actually take on the role, as the actor wasn't immediately interested in the character or the genre, saying, I originally passed on the script because most of what I saw was this far out evil guy. It's a pretty interesting place to go to, to basically play a renegade evil spirit embodied in a human form. You can't play him maniacally evil. That's too predictable. I just saw blood and I kind of turned it down the first time I read through it. Oh my goodness. And I just kind of skimmed through it, I must admit. But then after talking with Clive for a good while, I just began to think of it differently. Because of the tightness of the budget and schedule, Barker felt it was necessary to storyboard every single scene in the film, which he hadn't done on his two previous movies. The thing we were going to try and do was pull off a movie that looked like $20 million for half that. And that required organization down to the last degree. And that also required me to know every morning exactly what we needed. There wasn't going to be time for me to play the indulgent director. There wasn't the money for that. So that meant planning the whole thing from the boards and keeping to the boards more or less, which is pretty much what we did. Production took place on location in Los Angeles, with studio work being conducted in Culver City. The title at the time, like the story the film was inspired by, was still The Last Illusion. Clive very clearly wanted the movie to be half film noir, half horror movie. But he would soon find to his surprise that the studio was in more of a horror movie mood. It's worth remembering that this was 1995, and the revival of the genre with Scream was more than a year away. But while horror may not have been so hot, the studio still wanted a simpler picture than the one Clive was crafting. After post-production wrapped, the film ran a lengthy 121 minutes. The studio started screening the film and found it ran too long and the audience was a little antsy with the more straightforward elements of the plot. Clive would later say, This self-willed collision of genres, horror movie and detective film, caused the studio some headaches when I first screened Lord of Illusions. They wanted a simpler picture, with less emphasis on the noirish mood. Clive battled the studio, something he was no stranger to after enduring many headaches during the post-production of Nightbreed. Here's Clive on that matter. What MGM and United Artists did, and I'll think they're wrong till the end of my days, was say that this isn't enough of a horror movie. We want to make it more intense. It was a bad commercial decision in my view. They wanted to take out some of the detective elements. I said no. Part of the point of the movie is that this is a genre-breaking film. It moves from film noir to horror and back and forth, and that's what makes it work. But MGM and United Artists were adamant. They said, we're going to take this stuff out. Either you do it or we do it. So I said I would take it out so long as they promised me that a director's cut would come out on video and Laserdisc. Surprisingly, despite his reputation, Clive didn't have too many issues with the MPAA. Although they did make sure to cut some of the blood out, though plenty remains. One sequence that follows a few cultists leaving their families the worse for wear was cut because it was just too ghastly. Turns out the head of the studio wasn't crazy about the nastiness of the movie either. Frank Mancuso was head of MGM at the time, and he didn't like the movie at all. There was one shot of a dead child on the floor, and he said, this shot will never appear in an MGM movie. As it turns out, it did, because I took it out, and then when he wasn't looking, I put it back in. I knew he'd never bother to see the film again. If you watch very closely, you can sometimes see the soul escaping. The movie was shortened, going from 121 minutes to 109, 
which is still rather long for a horror movie. As Clive later noted, not so much of the gore or guts was excised, but the character work. And though of course his name is synonymous with horror, this was not to the author's liking. He would say, one of the things that happens is that if you take a few dialogue scenes out and pare them down, the acts of violence get closer together and the feel of the movie is more intense. Now suddenly you have this picture that is really going for the jugular and doesn't give you a moment to breathe. Of course, I took out what few moments there were where the audience was actually allowed to breathe. And at the second screening, the numbers doubled. They said it was the scariest movie they'd ever seen. Also removed was a sex scene between Harry and Dorothy, which Clyde blamed on the audience's apparent discomfort with the intimacy on display. He would later say, it surprised the hell out of me. I don't know why. I think horror fans are used to sex scenes being a prelude to death. They're used to sex scenes being about murder, and this one wasn't. With the studio satisfied, or as satisfied as they could be, the decision was made to release the movie in late August, not exactly known for being the most popular time of the year at the box office. Clive appeared to be understanding that the film wasn't right for the height of summer, saying, all those movies cost upwards of 60 or 70 million, and as good as our movie is, I thought we'd be trampled to death in that kind of company. So we decided to wait until those guys had run their spectacular course. I was born to murder the world. Lord of Illusions released on August 25th, 1995 in the United States and grossed a little under $5 million on its opening weekend. Not terrible for that era, but clearly not boffo business. It ultimately ended its theatrical run with around $13 million, and while most people would ultimately forget about the feature, a director's cut released on Laserdisc that restored the cut footage and gave the film some extra life. In 2014, Scream Factory released a restored version of the director's cut on Blu-ray, further ensuring the film would get rediscovered by a new generation of horror aficionados. And hopefully it has gotten the attention it deserves, because while it's not necessarily as startling as Hellraiser or as ambitiously bizarre as Nightbreed, the film is a clever and engrossing detective story, with some really memorable visuals and some pretty darn good writing. Scott Bakula is really enjoyable as our downtrodden private eye, and it's a shame we haven't got to see the further adventures of Harry as Barker once fantasized we would. Still, the character has lived on in Barker's literature, so those of you compelled by him in Lord of Illusions would do well to track him down on the page. I mean, that's where the strangest magic is usually found anyway. 